Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Good afternoon and welcome to Pacific Partnerships in Education. I'm your host, Ethan Allen, here on Think Tech Hawaii. Thanks for joining us. With me today in the Think Tech studios is Paul Haddock, President and CEO of Prell, Pacific Resources for Education and Learning. Welcome, Paul. Thank you, Ethan. And we're here to talk about uh, some current trends and issues in Pacific education, and uh, in particular to look at some of the, the upcoming challenges that the, the students and, for that matter, the educators in, uh, in some Pacific Islands are facing. So part of this is, this extends well beyond education, right? Uh, and there are, there are sort of political and uh, other issues that are impacting education right now in the Pacific. Uh, one of the biggest ones coming up is the COFA, the Compact of Free Association, right? That is, that is the COFA, the Compacts with the Marshall Islands and the Federated States of Micronesia. They pay for all the education down there. Uh -huh. And the grants are scheduled to end in 2023 which would be actually October 1st, 2022, for the fiscal year. Okay. The question when that happens is what will fund all the education in the Marshalls and the Federated States of Micronesia. So you're saying these U.S. monies basically are what now support all the, the education? All the education and the all the health down there is paid for under okay. these compacts. And is there any talk about renewing them? We, we are starting to hear that there's a consideration to look at what happens after 2023. Now, this compact that's ending was set up so that money was being put aside for a trust fund. Okay. But as we get closer to the cutoff date, it's clear there will not be enough money in that trust fund for those two nations to be fiscally independent in the areas of health and education. So the question is, what comes next? And mm -hmm. the biggest concern, of course, is that if the education and the health systems down there aren't funded or if they collapse, larger numbers of people from the region will be moving here to Hawaii. Right, and that's already some concern, right? We already have an out-migration of predictive youth there who basically see better futures for themselves in other places. Yes, about one-third of the population for the RMI and the FSM from the Marshalls and the Federated States have left. Huh. And this has been a significant brain drain down in those two regions, and a large number of them are coming here to Oahu, in fact. Mm -hmm. Right, and they can, they can find work here, which they can't there. There, there really is really limited options there. And unfortunately, that sort of sets up a, a vicious circle sort of situation, right? Yeah, the, the regions down there have some very unique, complex issues to solve. How do you have an economy on a small island? Right. How do you try to set up a tourist business if only one airline flies down there and they charge more than anything else? Mm -hmm. What do you do in some of the more traditional islands where maybe Sunday is a very holy day, you're not allowed to go swimming or do many tourist-type activities? We're never going to have factories down there. It's a fair question to ask, can these islands become completely fiscally independent? Right, but this, this was sort of was the point originally of the Compacts of Free Association was the U.S. was supposed to help them grow out of this colonized sort of dependency state into independent self-governing, yes. self-sufficient nation. And that's right. a completely different show right there. But right. I think 35, 40 years in, there's a lot of disappointment down in the region that they don't feel they've gotten the assistance that's been needed. Mm -hmm. We appreciate the money. Mm -hmm. Large amounts of money have been spent down there, but not as much training and assistance was given as was probably necessary for down there. I should point out, by the by, uh, Paul lived in, in Koshrai and Chuuk for 26 years or something like that, yeah. roughly. So has a great in-depth knowledge of the situation there, uh, working in the education field specifically. So uh, this, this is great stuff. So, so presuming then that this the compact funding ends, but the, uh, the compacts themselves are maintained in force, right? That is, so, so we are still obligated to patrol, protect those waters, and maintain some rights over those waters around the islands. And meanwhile, their citizens have a right to come and work freely in the U.S. without visas or anything, right? Yeah, the underpinning understanding of the compact was the U.S. wanted strategic value in the northern and central Pacific, and it's three million square miles of the Pacific. So the compacts were kind of a, you stay on our side, we'll give you protection. Mm -hmm. 
in return, we're going to give you money mm -hmm. and this idea of free entry. You right. may enter the United States. And the original idea was we want your college age students to come here, get a college education. We're going to make it as easy for them to come as possible so they don't need to have the visa or some of the other forms. But when they're done, they return home. Mm -hmm. That part's not been happening. And in the last 10 years, as the health situation has deteriorated down there due to a change in diet, more and more people are moving here and staying here. This has had a negative impact on the region down there. And there are growing concerns in Hawaii and in Guam about the impacts on health, education infrastructure, especially in who's funding all this. Right. And it's, it really actually goes beyond this. I was at a conference in San Diego last week talking with a gentleman from the University of Arkansas. And there's, there's a large Micronesian community there in Arkansas now. Uh, there's a huge Marshallese right, community. Yeah, it's right. the largest Marshallese community right. outside of the nation. And right. they're all working for Tyson Chicken right. and for Walmart. And the interesting thing is that in Arkansas, both Walmart and Tyson Chicken are putting some skin in the game. Mm -hmm. they, they've done a lot to help this community uh, in the areas of education and health. And I don't want to offend anybody, but I'm not sure we're seeing that same thing here. You go into any Walmart in Hawaii, you go into any Ross's or Long's or McDonald's, a lot of the working force there is made up of the Micronesian population. Mm -hmm. We're not really seeing those private businesses playing a greater role in helping solve or address some of these issues that the community is facing as they come here. And they're definitely benefiting from the Micronesian community being here. Right, but uh, uh, for instance, the Marshallese, have, on average in Hawaii, have an average income far, far, far below what almost any other group has, right? Well, they get the, the minimum wage jobs. Right. Uh, you work usually second, third shift jobs, and it's not a community that's going to ever go on strike or really raise issues. Uh, they're hardworking, quiet community. Mm -hmm. So there are things I think they tolerate that, that other groups may not tolerate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it, it does, yeah, it, it does put a, a burden on our systems here, uh, our health care system again. It, it, some people come in and need health care uh, and are not used to the intricacies of maneuvering the U.S. health care system, right? Oh, it's, uh, I, you know, I, I had to go to Queens Hospital a couple months ago. I had never seen a hospital that big before. I wasn't aware how to fill out the forms that you have to fill out. You go into an island hospital, everybody's related to you. And it's usually one building, one floor. You know where to go. You just ask your auntie or uncle. It's so much more difficult here. And I speak English. So imagine what it's like to go in and you've got 10 pages to fill out of all the diseases you may have ever had and your allergies. We've not done that before. So it can be very, very difficult for an islander coming in. And many of them are coming in for diabetes, other things like that, because even after 35 years of compacts down there, there's not one dialysis machine. These are some of the things that maybe I think the U.S. side could have done a better job training local doctors and nurses, mm -hmm. helping get necessary equipment down there so people don't have to come over here for some of the reasons they're coming health-wise. Hmm. Interesting, interesting. And there's sort of a uh, parallel situation in education, right? That is, a, the, a classroom on an outer island of Chuuk, for instance, looks very, very different from a typical U.S. classroom. And this, you know, I speak to teachers quite right. often. Right. And this brings back the first question I always ask the teachers is, why do we send children to school? And you get all sorts of answers, but it pretty much boils down to, to have a better life, so that they have a better life. Right. Well, what's a better life on a small island where the temperature is always perfect, You'll never, ever be homeless because you'll always have a place to stay. Mm -hmm. You've got lab lobster and crab everywhere. You've got yellowfin tuna jumping out of the water. You've got trees filled with breadfruit. The, the basic needs that we learn about in economics class, food, clothing, and shelter, will always be met. Why should I spend six hours a day learning stuff that even those of us in America growing up knew half the time we were learning stuff we were never, ever going to use? Right. So why have an education system, a Western education system on a small island in the West, and in the islands I mean, then they come here and everything's different. You gotta go to school every day. Mm -hmm. School is all day long. Right. And there's, you, mom and dad can't just come pick you up at 10 o'clock to take you to a funeral. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these cultural differences they're facing and struggling with, and the Hawaii school systems are frustrated too. We're trying to find solutions to make this mm -hmm. an easier transition. 
Yeah, it'd be, be interesting to, to look actually to look back to Arkansas and see what, what they've actually done because they're I'm sure it was a even a bigger shock to their school system basically having these, this influx. It'd be interesting to see how they've adjusted over the years because it's been about what twenty years. Roughly. It's been quite a while now, and for a long time things were going well, and it's just been the last two years where suddenly the the double edged sword of I know I can get a job at Tyson Chicken, and I know I can get a job at Walmart. So why should I graduate high school and go on to college or think that way when I've got this guaranteed job? If you're coming from an island where minimum wage is 90 cents or a dollar an hour, suddenly you can get a job at 11 or 12 dollars an hour. That sounds like a dramatic improvement in life. And mm -hmm. so just the last few years in Arkansas, all of a sudden, they're facing rising dropout rates because the kids know they have a job. Wow. So they're, they're trying to figure out how to handle this new shift. So things were going well for a while. Suddenly, there's a, a rising dropout rate because they, they know my future is taken care of. Interesting, interesting. I, I hadn't been aware of the, this, uh, the trend now. And that is, that's very worrisome, right? Because you always want to set an education system up where people understand the value of it and, and want to continue to pursue it and, and realize that sort of education is, a, is a good yeah. for the individual and good for the culture, right? And we think that way. Right. I, I want to go to college, right. so I get a better job. I want to get my master's. Right. I want to get my PhD, so things can be better. But that's where I keep coming back to, but if your whole life is, your basic needs are constantly met, why should I work the way, they, they watch us, the way we live, and the amount of debt we get into, and how hard we work to get more stuff. And to be honest, I kind of liked it the way it was down there, where you learn to be content. Mm -hmm. You have the, the basic things you need. I'm spending a lot more time with my family. So the, there's a priority for education. I just think it's a little bit different than maybe what we see. Huh, okay, In interesting. The, uh, so there's, you're, you're talking rather, really a rather profound cultural difference. So how, how then could we reshape the education system in the islands, or can we reshape the education system, or should we reshape the education system in the islands to better prepare our students to continue to live their sort of the same lifestyle they've lived? And that's one of the conversations we have in these school meetings. Mm -hmm. What's the point of education? Mm -hmm. My philosophy has always been it's to prepare a young person for a future that benefits themselves and their local community. Mm -hmm. If their local community is a small island, where basic needs are being met. Maybe we need some people who can be police. Maybe we need some people who can help build houses. We need a couple medical workers training kids for those things. Instead of, you need to take 12 years of math. Mm -hmm. You need to take 12 years of English. You better study your world history. A lot of that stuff, even when you and I went to school, mm -hmm. we knew that stuff was a waste of time. Right. We're not supposed to say that as <laughs> educators, but everybody else knows it's true. Why do we do the things, even here in Hawaii, I think it may be time that we really look, because what's the only thing emphasized now? Language and math. Mm -hmm. We're doing all this testing in language and math. We're sacrificing creative type classes right. where the imagination was spurred. And we're taking, we're forcing kids to do things that maybe 50, 60 years ago weren't considered as important. What do we need in Hawaii? What do we need on Oahu? Is it the same thing we need in Maui? And is that the same thing we need in the Marshalls? Prepare kids to be successful in their local communities is what I think we need to look at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's very interesting uh, because <laughs> if you, you're faced with kids who are going to come out and want this wide range of options, right? Some kids, yes, are just really going to want to sort of mail right in with their community, live a very traditional lifestyle, but other kids may want to go out and explore the range of higher education, advanced careers, Game, gaming, whatever, yeah. whatever the situation may be, electrical engineering, bioengineering, and how do you prepare those students? Well, clearly, if they're coming from the small islands and they're moving here, they have to have better language skills. Mm -hmm. That's been one of the biggest issues. We speak whatever language is on an island all the time because that's how we communicate. Mm -hmm. When they come here and everything's suddenly in English and they're five and six grade levels behind, it can be very, very difficult Frustrating for the teacher, too, who's got 25, 30 kids in a classroom, then a couple kids far behind. So one of the first things we're trying to help <clears throat> the Hawaii State Department edu education with is, let's take a step back, and if students are coming from a situation where they're far behind in English, and they're 14, 15, 16 years old, let's set up a transition school for them. And that's, that's perfect, and we are going to explore that more deeply when we come back. Right now, we're going to take a brief one-minute break here. 
Uh, Paul Haddock, uh, President and CEO of Prell. Uh, uh, I'm your host, Ethan Allen, and we'll be back on, with the Pacific Partnerships in Education in one minute. Minasan, konnichiwa. ThinkTech Hawaii ga Nihongo de Otodoke Suru. Konnichiwa Hawaii no Nihongo Hoso no Kosto, Kunisue Yukari des. Kakushu gets you a bino nijikara Otodoke Stimas. Nihongo Community, Hawaii no Nihongo Community ni Bendi na Otaske Joho. ニュースなどをゲストをお招きしてお届けする番組です。こんにちは、ハワイ。各週の月曜日2時から、ぜひ皆さん見てください。ホストの国瀬ゆかりでした。アロハ。Hi, I'm Bill Sharp, host of Asian Review here on ThinkTech Hawaii. Join me every Monday afternoon from 5 to 5.30 Hawaii Standard Time for an insightful discussion of contemporary Asian affairs. There's so much to discuss, and the guests that we have are very, very well informed. Just think, we have the upcoming negotiation between uh, President Trump and Kim Jong-un. The possibility of Xi Jinping, the leader of China, remaining in power forever. We'll see you then. And you're back here on Pacific Partnerships in Education, uh, here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. With me today is Paul Haddock, President and CEO of Prell, Pacific Resources for Education and Learning. And we've been talking about some issues uh, around education and, and some of the current trends related to the, particularly to the ending of the uh, Compacts of Free Association funding, uh, COFA funding. And just before the break, Paul was, was just starting to sort of say uh, a little bit about some, an idea that we have to help really prepare students who come, particularly from small outer islands, students who have really been uh, gotten a very different sort of education, education uh, from their uh, elementary and middle school levels that really doesn't really prepare them to enter, say, in high school uh, on par with, with kids who have been through the K-12 system here. Now, for the, for the sake of argument, let's just call those sort of transition schools, this idea that you're talking about. So maybe you can tell us a little more what, what you envision there. Well, one of the things we want to look at is, you know, I've been a teacher for 25, 30 years. I've been a principal. I know what it's like to be in a classroom with 25 or 30 students, and two or three of them are way behind mm -hmm. where they should be. You end up spending a lot more time with those students than sometimes you do with the other students. And it can be frustrating, especially in today's U.S., mm -hmm. because so much emphasis is placed on testing. Mm -hmm. Again, that's another topic. Right. But that's the way the system works. Mm -hmm. So if I've got 25 students who do really well on a test and four students who score very, very low, pulls my whole average down. Mm -hmm. This is where I'm hearing from teachers and principals in the state of Hawaii. We want to help these kids, but we're in a situation where it's just taking too many of our limited resources. What's your idea? Mm -hmm. The idea that I've been pushing and I've been getting some very good cooperation from the Department of Education is setting up some transitional schools, especially for the older students, the 14 to 15 year olders coming in who don't speak much English, Let's take a time out, because we want them to be successful. Mm -hmm. Let's take a time out, maybe six months or a school year where we just really emphasize English language learning. We do a lot of time on acculturation, how to behave in a brand new culture, how to behave in a brand new country, where you don't have the big family safety net mm -hmm. that you did down there, where everybody around you was a relative and was watching how you behaved. Mm -hmm. Now you're here where it's a completely different situation. Right. How to fill out paperwork, mm -hmm. how, you know, how to do things in a timely manner, because we emphasize time here. Right. How to just make them be more successful as they fit in, but it doesn't have to start day one, which is what we do now. Mm -hmm. They get off the plane, we throw these kids in a school situation, right. and they're not prepared for that. Right, then they get into sort of a vicious cycle of failure, right? They, they, they get into trouble, there's a, a cycle of failure, and one of the things we've heard too, and, and nobody has denied this, some principals have admitted to it, is they get the students to sign these forms where they opt out and choose to homeschool. Uh -huh. But they're not home, everybody knows they're not homeschooling because mm -hmm. the parents are busy working, right. but it removes the student from the classroom setting. Huh. So it takes a little bit of pressure off the school. The school Boy. can say, we wanted to help, but they've opted to homeschool. Uh -huh. What's resulting is you've got more young people out on the streets now without an education, can't get a job, they're bored. Mm -hmm. This is not a recipe for success. Oh, no, no, is... So let's hear what the principals and teachers are saying. Right. This is a, 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 for some of them, it's just a little bit extra work for the resources they don't have. Mm -hmm. And let's help this group coming in 
by putting them in a transitional type school mm -hmm. for six months or a year, build up those skills, mm -hmm. and then mainstream them into the classroom so that they can be successful. Plus, you know, that could actually also serve as a, as a, an, a, a sort of an immersion in American culture that some of them at the end of that might decide, no, you know, I really, actually, I want to go back. Yes. You know, I don't really want, I don't want to buy into this. I, I see what this is going to cost me, basically, in terms of losing, giving up things. Yes taking more effort, more time, and, and so now I will opt to, to go back and I'll be much happier where, where, I, where I was. You know? and, and I want to carefully yeah. emphasize, a large number of the young people coming in are fitting in fine. Mm -hmm. there, there are some kids, especially from outer islands where English is never used, right. where school is a lot more relaxed than it is here, who would benefit from a slower transition right. to the system? Yeah, I, I, I sort of a a very targeted approach to really give them the multiple levels yes. of support that they need. Uh, and, and as you say, uh, uh, an emphasis on the culture, an emphasis on the language. Uh, people really, they are, I don't want to say 24-7, but, but a much sort of deeper safety net, as it were, almost. Yeah, and again, about. it's all about how right. can we help them be successful. Right. These kids are all very, very smart. Mm -hmm. They speak many languages. Right. There are a lot of things they can do that we can't do. Mm -hmm. it's, a lot of it's about suddenly we're throwing them in a brand new language system. If, if we one year we did all of our American tests in the Japanese language, what would happen to test scores? Right. right. And it's got nothing to do with the intelligence of the students taking the test. You just can't read the question. Right. And that's kind of what we're asking some of these kids to do, and it's making it difficult. So let's look at an alternative that benefits everybody. Right, because the, a lot of the school systems in the region uh, mandate that schooling take place largely in English from certainly from relatively early grades. From about fourth grade on. And yet the teachers themselves are not particularly yeah, well trained happen. in English. Uh, the kids speak English nowhere except in school, right? So you've really got a, a very bad situation, right? And they, meanwhile, they stop. They don't teach Chukis and Chukis literature and Chukis history so much, yeah. right? Yeah, it's very difficult. We don't right. have Chukis textbooks, we don't have Chukis history books. Right. And the few history books we have are usually from an outsider's view of what's taking place right. in these, these islands. So the education system down there is failing. Right. Then they're coming here and they're being put in a situation where it's very difficult to be successful. Right. So I think there's a lot of questions we should address and I think we're on a pathway to addressing some of these issues. Excellent, that sounds, sounds like a really, like a, a potentially uh, you know, viable and, and productive solution uh, where we, we take these people, these students who really need this extra this extra time to get accultured, to get the language skills they need, to really you know, get that understanding uh, in place about what, what the value of schooling is, what the norms of schooling are in this country. And that doesn't always happen, you know, as you say, in, in the current situation. And, but certainly keeping these students off the streets out of potential legal trouble they'll be getting into fairly quickly, uh, out of bad Teaching habits. them a trade, yeah, yeah, right. teaching them some basic you yeah. know, work skills right. to where if you're going to live here, you can be successful here versus kind of what's happening now for, again, not for a large number. Right. It's, many of them are doing well, right. but the, we've got this other group. What can we do to help them and maybe take a little bit of the burden off teachers and school principals. Right, and so, so yeah, it's a, it's a, a very, uh, a, sort of a separate track just to help yes. help th those kids. And realistically, while that sounds look, potentially like in a sort of expensive option, it probably you're right, probably it's much cheaper in the long run. I think in the long run, you're gonna save yeah. money because when these kids are turning into their 20s and right. they can't get work, what's happening to them? And I'm sure that's costing money too. Right, and meanwhile, the teachers are gonna have a class that are better able to deal with more productively. There's going to be lots of benefits for those kids and for the teacher themselves and for the whole school. That's so, yeah. the hope. That's the yeah. goal. Yeah, yes. exactly. So this, this sounds like a good thing. And you say you're getting positive responses from the Department of Education. We've had this. some good meetings okay. with high-level leadership. They've asked us to put mm -hmm. together a plan. We're just starting to work on some mm -hmm. details. Uh, seems, but to get something started as quickly as possible. Seems like it might be something where the community colleges too would, would, would want to work on that. Well, what we'd like to do is we'd like to get, there's a large number of students from the region in the colleges here at UH, mm -hmm. at, at Chaminade, at HPU, make maybe some of their credits, they're spending time at the schools. Ah. So that if they need to, they can help translate, or I think sometimes the students are comfortable when they see someone there. Sure. And very often they're all related, mm -hmm. and so there's a, a 
an easier transition of respect if that's my older cousin, I have to listen to them. It gets the community involved. I just think it, and it's, it's a good way, too, to, to get these students in college to think about teaching mm -hmm. and going back to the islands and teaching. Exactly. We get better teachers down there. Right. I think we alleviate some of these problems, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. sounds like an excellent win-win kind of situation there where, yeah, the, the kids who are in community college get some practice in being good mentors, being yes. good friends, being uh, role models, as it were, and that, that could do them overall good too. Yeah, excellent. That's uh, that, that's that's wonderful. What about for the younger kids? Do you think the younger kids don't have this problem, or, or we find you know, I've, having taught as many years as I had, young kids learn. Okay, right. young kids can learn different languages. Young kids right. quickly adapt. Uh, I think the plan we're looking at now is starting at fifth grade up through twelfth grade. Right. Okay. Uh, below that. You'd be, you know, island kids are so flexible, so adaptable, they're so smart mm -hmm. that they tend to, to fit in. Okay, so it's more than the middle school, high school. It's when you get talking. Yeah, okay. older students, again, the, the episodes we keep hearing are the 14 to 15 to 16 right. year olds coming with maybe second grade or third grade level English. Right. What do you do with them? Right, exactly. When they're that far behind, you've got, yeah. you've got to, you know, you can't just expect them to. No, and you can't plop them in second right. grade either, right. so. <laughs> they won't fit in the desks. No, yeah. no. no. <laughs> Well, excellent. Uh, so, so this, uh, this transition school idea sounds like a great, a great uh, potential, potentially valuable idea, uh, a, a wonderful solution. Um, will take a lot of, of course, careful planning, uh, and, and uh, have to be well thought out as to how it gets done. But again, maybe we can get some of these corporations to help help support. We're, that we're hoping to, yeah. and we'd also like to, you know, any student from the islands who's in college, mm -hmm. feel free to contact us at Prell, feel free to contact me. We'd like to get you involved in the program. Excellent, excellent. So you, you heard it there uh, from Paul Haddock, uh, President and CEO of Prell. If you're a Micronesian student who's doing well and all and want to, want to help out with this uh, process of bringing more students into the uh, in greater success in the education system, uh, get, get maybe touch. make a few dollars too. There we go. All right. <laughs> well, excellent, Paul. This is this has been a very enlightening discussion. Thank you. I, I, I thank you for taking the time from your busy day to, to come and talk to me, and uh, I, I wish you great success with this. I, I look forward to perhaps getting you back on a little later, and we can, I appreciate we can, it. We can see how, how how it's developed. Thank you very much. And I hope you will come back then and join us on Pacific Partnerships in Education on our next show. Until then, I'm Ethan Allen signing off.